please join me in welcoming the last speaker of the Pyramid Series for the 2013-14 <coughs> academic year, Mike Milan. USA Today. USA Today. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, wow. I remember when I was sitting out in those seats and uh, we had um, speakers come in and talk to us and we can get some pearls of wisdom uh, um, from them. But it's great to be back at Morrisville State College. 41 years ago, my parents drove me here from our home in Buffalo as I became the first member of our family to begin a college career. I remember carrying all my stuff up the stairs and into my dorm room in Mohawk Hall and feeling great that I was in college. We then walked the campus, headed into town, and had lunch before going back to the dorm and saying goodbye to my parents. <clears throat> then I suddenly got scared. I was in college, three hours away from my home and all my friends, and wondering, is this really for me? All those fears, though, went away as I made my way to the journalism department and met our chair, Jerry Leone, who was a teacher in my hometown before he came here um, to head up the journalism department, and this is back in 1973. He welcomed me with open arms, mostly because we were both Italian-Americans, <laughs> um, and as did one of uh, his professors, a young guy with long hair and uh, a hippie from the, uh, the 70s, from the Vietnam era, a guy that drew really close to me as we are almost the same age, and that's uh, Professor Neil Benlow and his uh, lovely wife, uh, Carol. Um, they made me feel like this was my home. And it began a relationship um, that we have been close friends for the last 41 years. And that is an incredible accomplishment. And um, I'm now, Brian has put me on the committee that in 2017, how many of these students are uh, journalism students? All right, well, 2017, mark down in your calendars, uh, you're all going to be invited to come back here for the 50th anniversary of the journalism department. And if we keep a prayer uh, um, on for uh, Jerry Leone, who's uh, recovering from cancer, he'll be back here for the 50th anniversary, which I think is a phenomenal accomplishment for any institution. Um, that, that's what is so special about Mooresville. It is small enough for you to create lifetime friendships with your classmates and the faculty. I hope all of you have that same experience before you graduate from here. I mentioned earlier that on my first day here, I went downtown with my parents. Well, I spent a lot of time down there because back then the drinking age was 18. <laughs> I also wrote for the Chimes and we covered town news. So I got to know a lot of the townies, including a blind guy who used to hang out at the fort. <laughs> One day I'm sitting at the bar, and he shouts to the bartender, Hey, you want to hear a blonde joke? In a hushed voice, the guy next to him says, Before you tell that joke, you should know something. Our bartender is blonde. The bouncer is blonde. I'm six feet tall and have a black belt. The guy next to me is 6'2 and weighs 225 and plays rugby. The fellow to your right is 6'5", pushing 300 pounds, and he's a wrestler. We are all blonde. Think about it. Do you really want to tell that blonde joke now? The blind guy sits back, thinks, looks at him and says, Nah, not if I'm going to have to explain it five times. <laughs> Before I tell you what life has been like since Morrisville, let me introduce my soulmate, and my true inspiration for the past 10 years, my wife, Debbie. <laughs> Debbie is the director of finance for the International Institute of Buffalo. And eight years ago, she went back to school to receive her bachelor's degree in business and then continued on to get her uh, master's degree, and she got it with honors um, in accounting from Damon College. And on May 17th, she'll receive her um, master's diploma in the graduation ceremony. Two days before that, though, she'll be back here in the Syracuse area in Fayetteville 
as she drives in a limo to Fayetteville to pick up Miss America because Debbie is on a board that's bringing Miss America to speak in Buffalo uh, that afternoon and she'll be up here at her parents' home and Debbie's responsible for getting her in one piece back to Buffalo by 9.45 on that Wednesday morning. Um, Debbie has been my inspiration to achieve a goal I promised my father 39 years ago when I graduated from Morrisville. Back then, as Brian pointed out, journalism was a two-year program, and I was lucky because I had begun writing as a sophomore in high school as a correspondent for our community newspaper, the Tonawanda News. I covered the sports from our school for that paper. But because I'm a type AAA personality, I wanted more and hustled for more, so I became their top stringer and I got more stories, which got me more $20 bills because that's what they paid for writing stories back then. Upon graduation from Morrisville, I was accepted at Syracuse University's uh, new house. There's seats right up here. Feel free to come up here. Um, at Newhouse uh, School of Journalism or St. Bonaventure to continue my education for a bachelor's degree. However, the Tonawanda News, wait, we'll let these ladies sit down over here. Sorry. No, no, please take your time. You all set? You got lost. Okay, I'm just saying this. I graduated from here in 1975 with an associate's degree in journalism. I was accepted at Bonaventure, St. Bonaventure and Syracuse University for a bachelor's degree in journalism. But I was 20 years old and the Tonawanda News offered me a full-time job. I told my parents, they're few and far between, I've got to take the job. They demanded that I go back to college. I promised my father then, and God rest his soul, that I would go to school at night and get that degree. Well, he knew me better than I did and said that'll never happen. Well, here we are 39 years later. I have degrees from three colleges, two of them twice, and I'm very close. And Neil, you'll, uh, you'll get a kick out of this, but I've befriended the uh, dean of the communications department at Buffalo State College, and I have a meeting with him in two weeks to talk about going back to this September to finish off my bachelor's degree. I definitely think I'll be the, uh, the first 60-year-old graduate at Buffalo State College in the communications department. But the importance of that is, um, you'll see over here is a collection of things that I've, a few of the things that I've done over the years, and one of them is I wrote a book. How many of you are from Buffalo? Really? Wow. <laughs> Any area from Buffalo? How many are from New York State? All right. Um, there's a company, a food company, and those of you in business may know this. It's a privately held frozen food manufacturer called Rich Products. They're headquartered in Buffalo. They were founded there 45 years ago, and uh, they're now a $3.1 billion privately held company with plants all across the world and operations in a hundred and some countries. One of the things the chairman of that company told me is you can never stop learning. No matter how old you are, you can never stop learning, and also, you've got to know what you want to do. And so that's why I'm going back to school, because I think there's things in the communication field that I need to know of what's going on um, here today. So that's why I'm there. But I'm a lot like Neil. I'm a dinosaur, or hope. Um, well, when I was in school, um, computers, the internet, blogging, social media, 24-hour news and sports TV stations were not even thought of. In fact, the late Howard Cosell, a great legend in sports broadcasting, was still on Monday Night Football. Back then, we pounded out our assignments in class and uh, stories for the chimes on portable typewriters using paper. You used whiteout if you made a mistake. Brian, I don't even know, do they use paper anymore? They don't, they don't use whiteout for much. Oh, all right. <laughs> Some of the students try to put it on the screens, but that's okay. <laughs> but I'm a lot like Neil. I'm a dinosaur who entered the technology era kicking and screaming. But I'm getting better. 
I love posting photos and stories on Facebook and following the lives of many of my friends. They sign me up for LinkedIn at work. Do you know what LinkedIn is? Yeah. yeah. All right, well, all I did is on my emails, there'd come, you know, you want to accept Joe Smith in LinkedIn? Sure. So I just kept accepting all these people. About a month ago, the Buffalo Bills owner, Ralph C. Wilson Jr., <coughs> died. And on the same day, my good friend and Buffalo Bills Hall of Fame quarterback, Jim Kelly, was in New York City Hospital with cancer tumors uh, near his brain and in his sinuses. We were all very devastated. That night, I couldn't sleep, and about 1 a.m., while Debbie was sleeping, I went into my office and opened up my computer. Debbie knows I do this often, and she has warned me. No more emails after midnight. So as I was going through my emails, I came across one that invited uh, me to join or have them join me on LinkedIn. And I clicked it and I said, you know, I'm going to open this LinkedIn and find out what the heck this is all about. So as I looked, I had 2,500 connections. And as I scanned the list of connections, it was like a who's who of Buffalo business and media leaders. Then I saw that you could send emails. At that point, God took over. I've always been a spiritual person because my mom, God rest her soul, was a living angel. So I sat there at 1.30 in the morning and created an email that said, 39 years ago, Hall of Fame quarterback Jim Kelly came into my hospital room at ECMC where I was recovering from a near-fatal bicycle accident. And... He had a game ball, and I've got it up here on the, uh, the table, um, that him and the players voted me a game ball. Usually they give it to a player on the team um, after their come from behind win over Pittsburgh uh, the Sunday before that. Um, the surgery that I had took 17 hours, and twice during that surgery they came out and told my parents I wasn't going to make it, that uh, they were going to call a priest. At that point, my father gave the, the doctor this finger rosary. It's something he gave out to a lot of people. And he said, put this on his finger. Um, the rest is history. So I had this finger rosary on when Kelly came into the room, and he said, how you doing? You look down. I had tubes all over me, and um, because I was a type AAA personality, I had no phone, um, no visitors other than my family, and they put a guard outside the door to make sure of that. Um, but Jim, because he was Jim Kelly, was able to get in. So he looked at me and he said, take that finger rosary and say a prayer, but remember this mantra, and it's something I've kept with me my whole life, and that's positive thoughts equal positive results. Now the opposite is also true. If you have negative thoughts, you're going to see negative results. So I thought about it and he told me some stories about how uh, he went to the University of Miami how many of you know who Jim Kelly is? Probably most of the guys, football player um, and women. <laughs> he told me some stories about when the team was down and, you know, they're in the last, you know, few minutes of a game and how he would say a prayer as he went up to the, uh, the center and, you know, miraculously they'd have a comeback. So I told him to call my mom and um, I got the phone and I said, Mom, make a sign for my room. I want this sign large. I wanted to say positive thoughts equal positive results. And then on the outside of the room, I want you to make a sign that says, no one is to come in here and ask the question, why did this happen to you? And from that point on, my comeback began. And I you know, spent 44 days in the hospital. But as you can see today, I recovered pretty well from this thing. So in any event, I'm writing this email. And I said, um, uh, this was a Wednesday morning. And I ended the email by saying, here's my thought. What if we all stopped what we're doing at noon this coming Sunday and had a moment of silence and said a prayer for Jim Kelly and others suffering from cancer? With social media, we could get the word out to everyone, and it could possibly go worldwide. LinkedIn allows you to only send 25 emails at a time. So I then spent the next three hours until 4.15 in the morning sending out 2,500 emails to all these people. Um, I climbed back into bed and said a prayer for Jim, and the next day 
I got caught up in work and sort of forgot about this whole thing until that afternoon Time Warner Cable News called me and said they got a copy of the email and would I be willing to do a story um, on their station and did I still have the football. So I called my wife and she found the ball she said yeah but it's all inflated you can't even read it. So I went to a gas station filled it up and then went and did the interview with Time Warner Cable. The next day Thursday, the host of the area's top radio news uh, radio station called to say that they they usually have a topic every day. And the topic they were picking for that Friday morning before this Sunday when we asked everyone to make a moment of silence was the topic. And can you believe this? In, in, you know, uh, It was the power of prayer. Now usually regular radio stations don't talk about prayer and anything like that. So, And she said, would I come on at 7.50 in the morning? Now, I'm a PR guy. 7.50 on morning drive is like the key time to get anything announced because everyone's in their car or they're getting ready for work. So I said, sure. So I wrote everything down, what I'm going to say, and my wife was driving to work listening. And um, all of a sudden, the Lord took over because I couldn't read anything. I just babbled for the next 10 minutes. I don't even know what I said. All I know is that... Uh, uh, the top news reporter for the number one news station in Buffalo called to say that he got out of the shower listening to me and was standing there dripping wet listening to what I had to say and said he covered my news conference back in 1992 when I was in the hospital said I've got to do that story. Another friend of mine who's in PR called me up and said you've got to come out of the closet and tell your story and write a book. So I'm, gonna, I'm working on a, a book called The Power of Prayer. But, uh, Brian, let's watch that interview that appeared on the uh, CBS affiliate that evening. <coughs> if anyone knows the power of positive thinking and the power of prayer, it is former Buffalo Bison's general manager, Mike Bellotti. He survived a critical accident and received some of his greatest encouragement from Jim Kelly at the time. And now, Mike is giving back in return. Yeah, it's pretty uh, amazing how, uh, just like that, your life changes. It was back in 1992 when Mike Bellani almost lost his life to a drunk driver. Bellani was on a bike ride in Canada when he was struck by a driver going about 60. Mike hit the windshield and suffered a fractured skull and multiple internal injuries. The skin was separated on his back. He underwent 17 hours of surgery. They told my father, they said, I don't think he's going to make it. But slowly, Mike Bellotti came back. I was among the reporters who witnessed his recovery at ECMC. I know I'll be able to come back. Um, it's just going to take time. But we didn't know that it had been Jim Kelly who had given Mike the inspiration to see life in a different light. Jim had made a surprise visit. Holy cow, here's Jim Kelly. I said, what are you doing here? How'd you get in here? He said, what are you doing, Bellotti? And he throws me this ball. It was the game ball from the Bills' victory over the Steelers the day before. <laughs> Kelly was already a hero to Bellotti, who once covered the Bills for the Courier Express. And now the Super Bowl quarterback would give him a pep talk that became a turning point in Bellotti's recovery. He started telling me some stories of, um, you know, when he was injured in college and uh, when he was... Uh, when he would struggle to get back, that he'd always go to, he said his parents, are, they'd always push, be positive. Think about the winning. Think about the end result. I'm going to win that game. No matter how many points down, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. And I just kept repeating it. So now, Mike Bellani wants all of us to do something inspirational for Jim Kelly. What if we had a moment of silence at 12 noon this coming Sunday? Whatever you're doing, stop what you're doing, and just set up a good thought. If you don't believe in anyone up there, just send a good thought for Jim Kelly. But if you know how to pray, just say a prayer. Mike, who is now marketing director for the Food Bank of Western New York, is also hoping the Bisons will sign a team ball for Jim Kelly next Thursday on opening day. Reporting live, Rich Newberg, News 4 at 5. Thanks, Brian. And the Bisons did. Uh, that was my wife's idea. Um, they signed a baseball, and I sent it to Jim. He, um, he left the hospital in uh, New York City, and now he's back in Buffalo undergoing 
chemo and um, radiation treatment, and uh, we're all praying for a, uh, a miracle. As I said earlier, I was fortunate um, when I began in Morrisville because I was always already working on my career as a sports writer. Um, my parents had taught us about hard work because we grew up, um, you know, with not a lot. We were uh, Italian Americans. Their, their parents came over from Italy. Uh, we grew up in an Italian area on the west side of Buffalo. Um, and my uncle got into the dry cleaning business, and that's where my father worked for 50 years, delivering clothes to uh, to houses. Um, I got into that, helping him out as a young kid and learn a lot of lessons in business and in life by doing that home delivery and dealing one-on-one -on -one with the customer. Um, some of the lessons I learned from my parents and other uh, key adults that were true mentors of mine um, as a youth have stuck with me my entire life and have helped me achieve much of my success. They were simple lessons that had a profound effect on me, such as, not being afraid to work hard, not being afraid to do anything that is needed to get the job done, not being afraid to ask questions of the top person at a company if you have a question or if you want a job, and probably the most important lesson of all, treat everyone like you'd like to be treated. During my 14 years as an award-winning sports writer for three newspapers, I never knew what the word no meant. I knew I had a story to write, and if I needed a quote, or if I needed someone to clarify the facts, I had to find that person. The former superstar New York Daily News columnist Jimmy Breslin once told me to always make friends with the receptionist and the secretaries. They were the gatekeepers for the people who you will want to contact for your stories or um, in business to get a hold of uh, the top person. He told me to keep an index card on these gatekeepers with all kinds of facts about them and their families. Call and engage them in a conversation. Once they become familiar with you, they will let you in to talk to their boss or they will give you information they probably shouldn't give to you. Jimmy also gave me the two most important words that all of you should use regularly, and they are simply, thank you. Those simple words go a long way in telling someone you appreciate what they have just done for you. When I decided to take a full-time job at the Tonawanda News with a Morrisville Associates degree at the age of 20, it began a wild career ride for me. We had a two-person full-time staff at the Tonawanda News with a bunch of stringers covering local sports for us. It was great for me because at that young age, I had a press pass to cover the Buffalo Bills, the Buffalo Sabres of the NHL, and the old Buffalo Braves of the NBA. And that Buffalo Braves team has a connection to that racist owner who should finally be told to sell that team because that team that he has in Los Angeles was formerly in San Diego, <coughs> and that team was formerly in Buffalo. So that's how it got there. However, our emphasis was on local sports and local high school sports. I was soon promoted to sports editor, and a year later I was recruited by the Buffalo Courier Express, where at the age of 27, I became their high school sports reporter, working the 4.30 p.m. to 1 a.m. shift five days a week. That's part of the reason that I never got married until I was 50. The Courier was a dream job because along with covering high schools, I became the number one reporter on the Sabres NHL beat and was part of the Buffalo Bills um, home game uh, beat uh, during those seasons. Unfortunately, in 1992, the newspaper closed, a fate that is happening all too often these days to newspapers across the country. I took a job at the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle covering news in Buffalo. In the spring of 1983, I was supposed to move to Rochester to cover the baseball team, and then in that fall moved to Washington, D.C. to be part of the USA Today um, NFL coverage team. That all ended when I broke a story in January of 1983 that Buffalo's professional baseball team was to be sold in four days or the city would lose its team. 
my good friend Bob Rich Jr., president of Rich Products, came through and purchased the team. And after I wrote the story of his purchase, he asked me if I would like to work for him. That began a wonderful 14-year career, um, becoming the vice president and general manager of the most successful minor league franchise in minor league baseball history. Some of the highlights from a, from a career where I was known as the P.T. Barnum of baseball for some crazy promotions we used to run. During our first year, I received a phone call from a, a movie scout on Friday the 13th of May, 1983, who said he wanted to see War Memorial Stadium, the old home of the Buffalo Bills where we were playing baseball back then. He said he was looking for a stadium um, for the movie The Natural, starring Robert Redford. Um, his name was Mel Bourne. And when I went up and told Bob that Mel Bourne had called on Friday the 13th to look at our stadium for a movie uh, starring Robert Redford, he said, when his brother Sidney calls, take him serious. Well, we realized that there was some serious to it. He came in the following Monday. This was a Friday. We picked him up at the airport in a limo. He's driving down. He sees the stadium. He opens the window. He looks out and he says, oh my God, this is it. This is it. We pull into the stadium, he starts walking around, and five minutes later he's standing at home plate looking around. He gets on his cell phone and he said, Bob, we found your home. And he hands the phone over to him. He said, you got to meet this owner. He's a great guy. And he turns the phone over and it was Robert Redford. And as a PR guy, one of my greatest accomplishments is that we brought Robert Redford into Buffalo and kept it quiet to the media for five days <coughs> while he toured around and looked and gave his blessing on Buffalo, and if any of you have ever seen the movie The Natural? All right, you guys should look it up on YouTube or wherever and look at it, but it's a great baseball movie, and it was shot right in Buffalo that year at our stadium, and that brought, no one used to come to our games at that, at that time, because the stadium was in a bad part of the city, no one really cared about baseball then, it was a, a football and hockey town, but everyone came out because they thought they were going to see Robert Redford or Wilford Brimley or um, uh, Morgan Fairchild or uh, Glenn Close, who would all hang around there and come to the games. It was, it was pretty neat. We're one of the first minor league baseball teams to hire a company that r would roll a stage out onto the field after the game and have big name concerts. Um, you probably don't even recognize any of these names, but. Uh, groups like the Beach Boys, uh, uh, Aretha Franklin, um, Fats Domino, uh, uh, Fleetwood Mac, um, uh, uh, Huey Lewis and the News. Um, there was a ton of them, and um, a couple of country western uh, um, acts also. Uh, I can't recall most of them, but um, they would play right after the game. We'd fill the stadium. 15, 20,000 people would come out watching a baseball game, and then would be entertained in a two-hour concert. It was unheard of, and uh, we revolutionized that. We worked hard to build a downtown stadium in Buffalo while exploring the possibility of winning a National uh, League expansion franchise. When the stadium opened in 1988, we became the first minor league franchise to draw over one million fans for six straight years. Only two franchises have ever drawn a million fans, and we were the only one to do it six times, and the last one to do it. Unfortunately, we lost the expansion race to uh, the Florida Marlins and um, the uh, uh, Colorado uh, um, Rockies. Um, my career made a sudden stop on September 17, 1992, when a drunk driver hit me from behind while I was riding a bicycle over the border at my summer home in Canada. God again intervened and said he was not done with me because through a series of miracles, I was transported back to Buffalo, underwent 17 hours of trauma surgery and lived 44 days in the hospital. When I, be, when I got out, and this is where most of you swore at me, but you didn't realize you were doing that. Because when I got out, Governor Cuomo, this is Andrew's father, Mario, um, because of my accident, um, and, and because of the insistence of one of our assemblymen, put a bike helmet law in place. 
where I want it for everybody, and he wanted it for 16 and under, and I finally, you know, uh, disagreed with him, but he's a governor and he won. So we made a helmet law, 16 and under had to wear a helmet. So I'm sure as you guys were and the ladies were growing up and you didn't put your helmet on when you put your bike on, hel when you got on your bike and your parents yelled at you, I was the reason they told you to put the helmet on. So I'm sorry for that, but we saved your life. Um, I tried to come back to the Bisons, but I couldn't because I had a relapse from my accident. So I started my own publicity and um, <coughs> writing business, and uh, I handled the PR for an undefeated uh, heavyweight boxer named Baby Joe Macy, um, who almost became the heavyweight champion of the world. Um, I wrote the biography of Robert E. Rich, Memoirs of an Innovator, uh, that's up there. And then just before I got married, uh, Debbie asked if I would ever consider working for someone again and getting a steady paycheck. I said, only if I could use my God-given talents to give something back to the community. And lo and behold, the next day a friend of mine called and said, would I be interested in uh, going to work for someone that the Food Bank of Western New York was looking for someone to handle marketing and uh, PR. Um, after touring their facility and hearing what uh, they wanted me to do, I took the job and today, eight years later, we are now responsible for, 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 for providing food to 330 member agencies, soup kitchens, um, pantries, uh, shelters that feed 99,000 individuals in four counties in our area. 36,000 families and the most staggering st statistic, 42,000 of them are children. It really has been the most rewarding job of my career and I thank my wife Debbie for um, getting me motivated to leave uh, my own business and you know go to work and be able to give back to my community and uh, help out. As I look out among these, uh, these wonderful business and journalism students here at Morrisville, I'm concerned because of the times that we are living in today. About 10 million students have earned bachelor's degree since 2008. In 2012, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Almost half of the recent college graduates were considered unemployed. Working jobs that typically do not require a bachelor's degree. That compares with about a third of college graduates overall. And now, many recent graduates wonder if a college degree was even worth it. Worth all the effort and expense that they're going to bear or their parents are going to bear. Things have certainly gotten tougher for recent college graduates. A recent study has found that by their 30s, most college <laughs> graduates do end up in career-oriented jobs that, can re that require the degrees that they earn through college. But this long on-ramp to a decent job can exact a price in earnings for many years. A new report from the Brookings Institution finds that many people in their teens and early 20s <coughs> are stuck in a job market that is so terrible for young adults and has been for years that has reached crisis proportions. But you alone can change these statistics from your position right here at Mooresville. The artist Pablo Picasso once said, the meaning of life is to find your ultimate gift. It means you've got to dig down inside and have an answer when they say, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to do from here? We're all, you're all young and you're at a tremendous part of your journey in life. How are you wired? What makes you tick? What do you really want to do for the next few years, for the rest of your life? I've got a solution that a friend of mine, a motivational speaker, the late uh, Zig Ziglar once presented, and I was lucky enough to be in a private audience for this, and it's called Create a Goals Program. How many of you have goals? All right, how many of you have written goals? How many have written goals that you review every week? Hmm. All right, here's what I would suggest. Open your laptops 
and start listing everything you want to do for the rest of your life from today on. Do not say, I can never accomplish that, to anything you write. Just write it. Keep writing every day for a week. Every day, <coughs> open that up and read everything on that list. Because I'm not a psychologist, but I guess by reading and writing, it touches a certain part of your brain and it gets in there and it keeps repeating. After a week, go back and review the list. Take out things that you don't want, embellish others, and then go back and read each entry. Make sure you want it, embellish the items that you like, then create a timeline. Say, A, I'm going to do these in the next three months. B, I'm going to do them in the next six months. C, a year. D, three to five years. Whatever timeline you want to put on. Then go over every item and list A, B, C, D, give them a letter, and then go back to the A's. Now you take all your A's and you get a, a separate page and you're now writing them again, all your A lists. And then another page for all your B's and your C's and D's, whatever timeline you set up. Then go back to the A's and prioritize them and list under each one what will it take to accomplish that goal. Then each week, call a team meeting with yourself or your boyfriend, girlfriend, or some other friends, and compare the list. What did you do that week toward that goal that you said you're going to get done in three months? Then look at the ones for six months. Did you do anything on those? How about the ones for the year? It's not easy. It's like taking a course. But if you follow this plan, you will and you can achieve anything you want in life. Remember, everyone wants to be a leader. However, if you think you are leading and no one is following, you are merely walking. Remember also that success is not the key to happiness, but rather, happiness is the key to success. We live in a fast-paced, material world In a society where families are broken up because both parents work, if there's both parents, and the kids need to be taken everywhere every night because there's always something going on, family dinners have become a thing of the past, we need to slow it down. We need to smell the roses and remember that there's more to life than just your career. You've got to try and balance your life with family, friends, and your faith. If you do that, life will suddenly be much easier to handle. And when you think you're down or when you get depressed or this or that, get out of yourself and give to others. Go volunteer at a hospice or a hospital or a nursing home or some place a not-for-profit. Do something for someone else. You'll find amazingly how this will come back to you tenfold. Pursue your talents. Follow your heart. Find your purpose in life, and following your passion are the keys to true and everlasting happiness in life. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'll keep you all in my prayers that you find happiness and success in life. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of gifts to present to you, and then we'd like to take a few questions. Um, I uh, actually have a modest gift from the campus store, something for you and your wife for the decaf in the morning. Ah. I think you know where I'm going with that. Ah, so, I don't oh, let, me, let me open this up here. <coughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> Morrisville State College, a place near and dear to my heart. Thank you very much. Professor Johnson has something to So have. this is end of our group, of course, gives you something to go to work. So here's a portfolio. So every time you have to take a note, as our students do, you'll think of us. Wow, okay? thank you very much. We're going to open the floor to questions, and I'd like to ask the first one. Mike, you have an interesting... Oh, even a Mooresville pen. Absolutely. You have, and the logo inside, too. You have an interesting uh, combined life of journalism and business, not that the two are ever separated by too much, but because we have a, a dual audience of journalism and business majors, I'd like you to comment on, as a journalist, 
what you find to be the most important uh, characteristic or trait of someone in business, and where do you find business people to be the most lacking in their professional lives? So, kind of approaching the question from both ends. Why couldn't we have a lot of students? <laughs> um, I think the number one trait in business is honesty. Um, that's what I have found. Um, be honest, uh, be ethical. Um, especially nowadays with social media, you all have to watch out, you know, what you're putting on um, your Facebook or whatever these things are calling, you know, today. I've seen way too much from high school kids and probably college the same way is um, the sexting. Is It's only going to come back and hurt you down the road because um, you can't hide that stuff that's on the Internet. And if you go look for jobs, people pull this up now. And they look and see what you've done. They they research and talk to uh, um, your references. But now with social media, they have someone that just goes and tracks your name and finds all this stuff. And they won't tell you that's why you didn't get the job. But that's why you didn't get the job. One of the reasons you didn't get the job. Um, some of the things lacking, I think, courtesy. Um, everyone seems to be so busy that they don't have the courtesy to return a phone call. That I can't, I don't have a lot of uh, uh, patience for that, for people that don't hit. I'm a busy person, but I have time to return calls and emails, you know, within a, a reasonable amount of time, a day or two. But if I don't hear back from someone, that really tells me that uh, um, they just don't care, and I don't care for them. Um, that's, that's one. And I would, I would think um, a lack, those that have a lack of respect for people that think that they're too big and that they can't deal with the, uh, you know, a common person. Um, I think everyone should be treated equal and unfortunately a lot of, you know, people in business don't. They take their job and, you know, they think they're too big hiding behind the, uh, the title. Um, it's a challenge getting jobs because what happens now is everyone writes to these same companies and they have resumes this high. So a practice I did, and I found great success for it, someone told me is, is research, you have one shot at sending that letter and your resume. Research the company you want to go to. Um, and now with internet and Google and all that, you can learn an awful lot about them. And then write to the top executive of that company and tell him or her why you feel you'll be an asset for their company. What's going to happen there is he's not going to, you know, trash your letter. He'll send it down to the HR person with a note of, you know, look into this person. Or, you know, this is an interesting letter. Now the HR person feels committed because the president just sent him a resume and he's going to look at that. You know, it's, it's one of those little tricks that you may use to, uh, you know, get ahead of the uh, pile of resumes. And then the whole process of hurry and wait, you get a resume in there and then you got to wait forever to ever get a phone call. That's why you got to have some hobbies or something to keep yourself from going crazy that they haven't called you, you know, on that job interview or told you how well you did in that job interview because they're so busy, they don't have the courtesy to tell the applicants, you know, what's going on. So it's a challenge, but you got to work at it. You, it's, it's probably a, a job in itself, just looking for and pursuing a job. Any other questions? Yes? Um, you stated that um, you were the first minor league baseball with uh, the big name artists. How did you afford that if no one was coming to like the games? And stuff? Well, by this time we were in a new stadium and uh, people, um, it was a new place to be in downtown Buffalo Pilot Field. We've got a, a photo of it back here and we we're selling out and drawing a lot of people. Um, and we, we found a corporate sponsor to cover the post-game concert. They gave us money to help pay for the, uh, uh, the concerts. Um, now we, the, the teams aren't doing it because um, these, literally they're washed up acts. I mean, the Beach Boys were 30 years from their prime, but because of all the uh, um, Indian um, um, casinos, and, and their rooms in there, they're paying these bands big money to play at the casinos 
So to come and play at a baseball stadium, the numbers are well over $100,000. It's, it's ridiculous. But back then, we, it was like thirty or forty or 50000 We were able to afford that with sponsorship and ticket sales. We drew a lot of people you know, with these games. And we covered it through sponsorship dollars. And we went out and sold corporate sponsors um, the, the fun of the ballpark. And it's things you all see when you go to sporting events or concerts. You see logos of companies all around. That's sponsorships. And uh, that's another part of you know, sports management. Any other questions? Yes. You talked about hiding Robert Redford in Buffalo for five days. You think you could do that today? Oh no, it, it <laughs> could never have, not with uh, cell phones and photos and all that kind of stuff. Everyone, you know, people take pictures. I was at a place the other day and took someone at a luncheon, took someone's photo, had it on Facebook, and before the luncheon was over, there were a dozen comments. You know, it's it's. I'd love to know how you did it then, for that matter. Was, well, they were really pretty. Hard? No, they were pretty. See, they have uh, for him. We we flew him in on a private jet, and he only traveled with a um, um, a van. He 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 only drives a uh, um, a Mercedes, a diesel Mercedes, and the only diesel Mercedes in Buffalo was in New York City. So we had a set, and they have drivers that drive around all the movie trucks and all that. He had a flight in New York, get in that diesel um, Mercedes and come there and have it in Buffalo by the time Redford got off the plane when he came in for good. But when we had him here, they put him in a van with dark windows. Um, we put him at someone's house in the city, you know, nice family, it was a big house. Um, but we drive him in a driveway right in the house. We had a restaurant that we swore, swore the guy to secrecy, and Rich had spent a lot of money there. So he, it would step up to the second level, and we had curtains put, the night that he would come, we'd have curtains put up there, he'd come in the back door, and we'd sit there all night and have dinners, and you know, the, the one night, it was like, a, I, I would get the bill, because I had to you know, deal with it. It's like $3,500, I'm saying, oh my God, these, they're drinking wine like by the case. But they didn't care. These movies have huge budgets, and they just spend like crazy. But we kept it quiet, and uh, he was able to get on the plane and left. And that's why he really liked working with us in uh, Buffalo. Yes. Uh, and what's your name and major? Uh, my name is Devin Biesmer. I'm a business administration major. One second. Your name and major? Um, Erica, automotive business. Automotive business? Yeah. Where do you make your home? Um, Westchester, New York. Automotive business. Wow. I know a lot of car dealers in Buffalo that are, in fact, one, we'll get to your question. There's a car dealership in Buffalo called Basil. It's uh, five brothers, they own 10 dealerships, and they wanted to give away a car this summer. Now every dealership gives away a car, but they said we want to give away a car and be philanthropists. We want to do something for the food bank. So what they did is went to a radio station that has four, three FMs and one AM, <coughs> And they're doing a promotion from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And um, it's called Cans for Cars. And all four of those radio stations are going to run the same commercials, um, tying in their station to this promotion. There's going to be 20 live remotes between Memorial Day and Labor Day from the radio station disc jockeys right there. And then they're going to encourage people to come in with bags of food or a can of food and put it in a car. There'll be 10 cars and they'll be wrapped with the logos and all that stuff on them. And you fill the car up with food and then we'll have barrels for the excess and we'll pick up the barrels of food for those three months. And uh, then to sign up to win the car, uh, rather than the name and address, it's now high tech, they have uh, laptops for every dealership. You put your name in by computer. So if you put your name more than once in, they kick it out so that they only have your name once. And then every morning, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on the top-rated FM station, the disc jockey is going to announce a finalist. And at the on Labor Day, there'll be not, there'll be a hundred finalists to win this car. They're going to have a party, and the last name pulled wins the car. The other 99 will get a bunch of prizes. So you could sell that idea to a dealership in Westchester. Your question. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, my, it's kind of got a few parts to it, but I'm going, um, going to what you're doing now uh, with the food bank. So um, could you kind of outline your, your process and the changes you had to make, you know, with the organization and yourself to go from marketing and PR to CEO? You're a student? 
Oh. <laughs> well, the CEO, Brian, again, was wrong on his facts here. Of, see, as journalists, we, we live by a credo of we never let facts get in the way of a good story. I love the title of CEO, but I'm the, mar I'm the uh, what am I? <laughs> Public and Community Relations Director. Okay. Right. Yeah, so the, the sign is wrong, but we, I like that, and I'm going to keep that. Um, but no, the, the quite, it's a good one. It was really tough going from the for-profit uh, arena to now raising money to feed the hungry. And what I've done is I've used a lot of the same tools that I used to get corporate sponsorships and get media out to cover things in the not-for-profit arena um, to create events. Like we do a walkathon and we raise you know, sixty or seventy thousand dollars. We do a um, uh, a sweet charity uh, uh, party with you know uh, food stations and all that. So we're using the same tools, but the result is different. We're raising the money, but rather than going to the CEO's pocket uh, and the bottom line, it goes to buy food and to uh, uh, for the cause of that charity. So the same tools, but different result. Your next question. Uh, could you give us so, so much, sir. What was your key to your success and advancement? And then, you know, could you share some insight with us for what we, you know, how we should approach success? Um, key to success, I think, <clears throat> um, because I didn't have, you know, the, the, educational background, other than, you know, the associate's degree here that really helped. The two years here in the journalism department under Jerry and Brian and Dan Reeder and, you know, the other professors here was tremendous uh, hands-on experience that allowed me to do my job as a sports writer at the Tarnawana News and then be promoted to the Buffalo, um, you know, paper. The way I got promoted was out of hustle. Um, I had this job description, but I busted through the job description and did more than what was um, what I wanted to do, what they expected me to do, I did over and above. And wasn't afraid to come in early and leave late and just do uh, more than what was expected of me. If someone didn't do it, I would jump in and offer to do that. So they knew that they could count on me. I won in... in we had the three papers have a <coughs> annual competition for awards and that. And my first year at 22 or something like that, I won the Rookie of the Year award. And the statement was, because of his versatility as a reporter, he's a sports writer, but he has um, all kinds of uh, different stories, from news to features to uh, rock and roll reviews and things of that nature. So not being afraid to do um, anything and not being afraid to ask questions. And it was through, you know, Neil Benlow's news writing classes and, and him leading the chimes that I learned, you know, don't be afraid to ask someone the question. All they could say is no. And too many people were shy, well, what if, you know, were self-conscious. You know, I could care less. What are they going to do? Now I really don't care because I almost died. So what could they do to me now? <laughs> so I'll ask anyone any of them. Um, so it's really that. Just really hustle, but know what you want to do. And for me personally, um, you know, prayer has been a big component of my life and being a spiritual person. You. you said you had a third question? Um, no, that kind of, you kind of answered that. Now, what year are you here? I'm a first semester senior. First semester senior? Yes. We're in the last semester here. Though. I know. I you got to come back again? I, t I do, just for one semester. Wow. I uh, transferred in, so I took a semester off. And are you under 25? Yeah. See, the, the bright future here, Neil. I'm very excited. Mike, now, where do you make your home? Uh, in Hamilton, actually. Oh, right near here. Yeah. To dovetail on that, I hear from a lot of employers, uh, especially in journalism, that new employees come to work today with a list of things that they won't do. And I just wanted to reiterate what you said about being willing to do whatever it takes, no job too small. Um, yeah, let me talk first. How many are in journalism? All right, um, what do you want to do to start? Me? Um, yeah. I want to go into PR for music. PR for music. 
want to teach English in Japan. Te teach English? In Japan. In Japan. Wow. Really, some great goals. Yes? Um, I just want to be a reporter, journalist. Be a reporter. Who else had their hand up? <laughs> just jump right in. Uh, graphic design. Great field. Uh, I want to report about the chaos going on abroad. In where? Abroad. Oh, abroad. Wow. I'm, I, I'm anxious to learn about that. That is unbelievable. It's sad. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it doesn't get real bad. They're all Russia situation. Yes, in the back there. Uh, I want to go into advertising. Advertising. Who else in journalism? PR, uh, Arthur, photography, honestly. I'll be a journalist. <laughs> I like that. Well, you know, you all know what you want to do. Now, look at that field, and now with the computer, you could Google anything and find out who the best is in that field and learn from them. Don't be afraid. You want to be a journalist, a newspaper writer? Uh, online, yeah. Online. Find out who does that, write them, and say, hey, how did you get to that point? Befriend people you don't even know. The same in business. Those of you that are in business looking to get into, you know, the field of business. If you wanted, you're an auto uh, tech business. If you want to get into the auto field, you know, I wouldn't write to Billy Fucillo because he doesn't return, you know, letters <laughs> and all that. But you find a dealership that's owned by, you know, Joe Smith who owns 10 dealerships, write the guy. Say, look, I'm in my final year here at Morrisville State College. I want to do this, this, and this. What do you recommend? Guy'd be a fool not to respond to you. And if he does, doesn't respond right to the next guy. But someone's going to answer that letter and give you a tip and maybe invite you in. And that's how you try to get the edge above you. What's happened in journalism, especially TV journalism, is pretty sad. Um, you know, I, I, I hate to see where we're going in this country, you talk about abroad, I'm worried about here that history truly doesn't repeat itself because I could see the next civil war becoming the haves and have nots because what's happening is companies are buying up more and more companies and becoming bigger and they're only looking at the bottom line and the best way they can improve the bottom line is getting rid of people because it's the number one expense for most businesses. And what, that's what's happening in, in journalism with newspapers. Um, now newspapers are suffering because people aren't buying the newspapers again. And with less circulation, it's less advertising dollars. So they're looking for non-traditional revenue. That's why they're getting into printing. That's why they're getting online and all that stuff. But TV news is even tougher challenge because they're getting rid of the older reporters and camera guys and they're getting in what they call a backpack journalist, and they're paying them like almost minimum wage to go out and do it all themselves. It's really sad, but it gives you an opportunity to get in that door. Like Time Warner Cable now has 24-hour uh, news and the markets were there, and well, they're gonna be Comcast, and hopefully Comcast will keep the same thing. But you gotta get in, just get your foot in the door, and then show them with your hustle that you're there, you're there for them. But yeah, you're right. Just sitting back and saying, no, that ain't for me. Well, guess what? You're not going to have a job very long. Because it is a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. But that's why you got to find balance in yourself. Have hobbies, play sports. It's all right to party. But I'm telling you, and I could talk from experience, that I've seen too many people that, you know, found... I used to give a talk. I, I gave a talk one time at a high school, and I knew these kids because I covered them in, in sports. And I knew what they were doing out behind the school and all that. And I gave a talk. It was a sports awards dinner. And uh, all their parents were there. And I said, uh, um, what I don't like about what I'm seeing in school right now is sad. S period, A period, D period. I'm seeing too much sad in school. And they're all looking like, what are you talking about? And I said, sex, alcohol, and drugs. And their parents are looking up and the kids are like, you know, one kid yelled out, yeah! <laughs> His parents didn't like that too much. But uh, unfortunately, everything has to be done in moderation. And what I'm seeing with those three letters for kids in high school, um, and you know, you've all been there, it, it doesn't get you anywhere by mastering in those three letters. Next question. Any other questions?
Well, we've done it all. Please join me in thanking Mike for the great day.